So I raised the issue of Keynote 21G. A couple weeks ago, we had an accelerated approval for the use of uh, pembrolizumab in combination with a standard platinum doublet, carboplatinum, pemetrexid, uh, in non-squamous, non-small cell. They uh, went as far to say that uh, it did not matter what your PDL one status uh, was for that regimen. Jared, I'd like you to kind of give us your perspective on on that, and I'll ask others. To I, I think in. he's biased, so. So yeah, with uh, well, uh, my bias is I was trained by the presenter of that uh, <laughs> uh, trial. So that was a randomized phase two trial. Um, Non-squamous histology, as you mentioned, PEM carbo versus PEM carbo pembro. What we knew before ASCO this year um, was that there was a PFS advantage um, to the uh, triplet. Um, added toxicity, um, it looked roughly additive. Um, but in the early data that we saw, there was no survival advantage. Um, and I think to the surprise of some, uh, that was grant, uh, approval was granted based on the results of that data. What were, were I just want to say, was, was that a, a general consensus that people were surprised with this accelerated well, approval? Or? I mean, I think all of us have been a part of uh, randomized phase two studies of about 60 in each arm where one arm looked better and that did not lead to an FDA approval. Right. Um, you know, it, it was a, a primary, <laughs> well said. the primary endpoint was a uh, response rate, right? yeah. you know, 55 versus 29, that looks pretty good. PFS looks better, uh, but as Jared says, the OS doesn't seem to be there. And what's a little surprising is the confirmatory phase three is just around the corner. About right? six uh, months. Yeah. And it's not like that trial hasn't been done. It's right. enrolled, we're just right. waiting on the results. So, right. uh, but you know, I, I'm supportive and I think it, I'm hoping uh, the phase three data will confirm it. Um, you know, it's it's a mouthful in terms of a regimen, but right. uh, you know, it, it could be a step forward for patients. Yeah, but please remember, accelerated approval was set up just for this situation. Right. You have some compelling early data uh, and a confirmatory trial close on its heels. So why not approve it, knowing that more data is going to be coming in? Yeah, the the only issue there is what if the confirmatory data doesn't confirm it, and then. What do yeah. you do? Then you take it back. Then you yeah. well, we, we, we have this like, issue right now, actually, in bladder, bladder cancer, cancer. Yes. Uh, with, with yes. tezolizumab. But um, yeah, hopefully, I agree with Mark. I mean, that's why the system's set up this way. It's just the, I think for those involved, uh, us involved in research, the rules have changed a little bit. Uh, but for patient care, it could be a great thing. But yeah. It's also drugs that we know. We, we yeah. know that they each have single agent activity. It's likely to be additive. The toxicity is likely to be additive. and and more data will help us make those choices. You know, it's reasonable. I, I and there is a little you. more data um, from, from ASCO this year. Yeah, right. Um, we uh, got a peek at the survival curves, hazard ratio of 0.69, uh, but not, uh, not reaching significance with those small numbers, P of uh, 0.13. What was interesting there was that this happened despite very heavy crossover from the chemotherapy arm um, to right. immunotherapy, about 75%. Yeah. I mean, there are, there, are, there are other criticisms. I mean, there are imbalances between the arms. There's a two to one imbalance in never smokers in favor of the, the experimental arm. So, you know, who knows yeah. what is, but actually I think Mark brings up a very good point is, I think we were struggling with saying, well, why did they approve it when the confirmatory trial is coming down the corner? Maybe that's exactly why they did because their amount of unknowing time if they've, if they've messed up the approval isn't gonna be very long. Hmm. So and it's, again, it's not a stretch, it's not, right out of the right. blue. These drugs work, they work in this disease, and they likely add in some way, but how much is to be decided? So I don't think these results are adequate to mandate that a practitioner well, do this. Now. Well, that, that was where I was going yeah. with this. So how many of you have given this regimen off of a clinical trial in a patient since the accelerated approval? So I have a, I have a patient coming in next week <laughs> where it's, it's been ordered. Okay. Um, so we're set, we're poised to, to start <laughs> to do with it. one patient. Ross? But uh, wait, no, did, no, did you check that person for PDO one status first? Yeah, patient's negative. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I think there's consensus that we'd all check first. Yeah, yeah. Those people, everybody agreed to that. That if we they were high PDO one, we would put single. We treat That's them right. with single agent. Yes. So technically, we don't. Wouldn't this trial would let us give, throw chemo on as well. Well, that's the next question. It kind of is, it says it's regardless of PDL right. one status. So the implication is, well, if it's regardless, why do we have to? test for it. And I, we've been advocates of saying you do because if you have a high expressor, single agent Pembrose, effective and safe therapy, right? Absolutely. And patients yeah. value, and I think oncologists value a non-cytotoxic regimen. Correct. Correct. We, should, we should point out that even though they said, you know, regardless of pdl one the data they showed 
was that response rate didn't change by pd one status. They didn't show anything about whether the PFS or duration of response varied. Right. We haven't seen that yet. No. Right. No. And it's very small numbers, yeah. so it's going to be hard to tell. But if you had a case where response rate was important, a very symptomatic patient, well, you can make a case for giving the two drugs. Yeah. The two classes, rather.